you're wearing a Halloween it was two three truths and a lie. Halloween yeah. three is the lie. second oh best of the That's franchise. Ridiculous. Whoa, 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 whoa. Justice for Tommy wait, wait, Lee Wallace. Need, need... Barbarian was trash, though. Oh wow. Wait, what? Does anybody want to replace Sorry. this? Scene? What? Hated that movie. What? Okay, why? I just need to know why. I'm almost a week out from MegaCon, the four-day event in Orlando, Florida, and I'm still recovering. I'm still a tired panda, but I'm gonna get through this video quick and go over some of the highlights. So quick overview of what happened. I was invited by Sean Chandler and Cody Leach, fellow movie critics, to head down to Orlando, Florida to talk movies for a few days. I did three of the four days of movie panels. There was a hot takes panel. There was a, is the comic book bubble burst? And there was a horror panel. I was on those. I had a great time. I learned a lot. I, uh, I looked at my performance and definitely took about 3,000 notes for the future if I go back to one, which I absolutely hope to do. Bottom line is this was a great experience for me. It was an awesome time being able to meet people that I've never seen before. I've only, I've only had the experience of an avatar under a YouTube comment. And so after doing this for over a decade, it was so wonderful to be able to actually put faces to names and realize, wow, when I'm working in my studio, I'm in my cave year after year, just pumping out content and hoping someone's watching and listening to finally see that and understand that, oh my God, wow, people do actually watch my show and they do have some of the same ideas about movies I do and they're just passionate about film. It was incredibly heartening it was a, it gave me a warm glow in my tummy and I, I felt great about it. I mean, maybe that was, that could have been indigestion too because I didn't eat very well. But regardless, the other piece that, uh, that really brought joy to my, to my balls was meeting Cody, meeting Sean, meeting some of these other people along for the ride and uh, getting these connections. I'm going to have some of them on my live stream. I already did a live stream with the guys I was with. It was a fantastic time. You can find that on the live tab on my YouTube channel. But for today, I'm going to be showing highlights from these three panels I was on. No context needed. I'll, I'll try to like kind of build into them, but th they were a great time. I had a blast. You can find the full panels on my Patreon at patreon.com slash adamdoesmovies. I know Sean has already posted one on his channel. Cody's going to post one on his and they have a few other panels to do. I don't know if all three of them are gonna be available on their YouTube channels, but I'm giving you the highlights, and if you're a supporter, you get those already on Patreon. It's it's a win-win-win, really, at the end of the day. So, without further ado, here is some of the highlights from 2024's Megacon. Enjoy. Good. You're wearing a Halloween It was two three truths and a lie. Halloween 3 is, is the lie. second not best not of the That's franchise. Whoa, 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 whoa. Justice for Tommy wait, wait, Lee Wallace. I need, I need... If you are a human being and you know, well, we all know what happened to Paul Walker. We grew up with Paul Walker. We love Paul Walker. I don't care if you hate all the Fast movies. There is no way you watch Fast 7 and you watch that ending and you do not cry. I wept like a five-year-old girl watching my girl for the first time. It's been a long day. I see, I knew I liked you, you, my, my friend. friend. And I tell you all about, and I see the montage where they're looking at, yeah, each, they're bro, looking at each other. Bro, he pulls up. I got goosebumps just thinking about it. He goes, do you think you could leave without saying goodbye? The original Friday the 13th from 1980 is a terrible movie. I don't care if it started one of the most iconic franchises as a film. It's not made well. There are so many things in that film that just add to nothing. There's a whole fucking scene for like two minutes where they just stand on a dock. There's nothing in the scene. They have a snake that they kill. Why? Because they have nothing else to do. They're trying to make a Halloween ripoff, had no plot. And who's the killer at the end of it? Oh, hi, old woman that we've never met the entire fucking movie. Wow, I... Don't know if we can be friends after this because the first Friday the 13th film is a brilliant slasher. It kicked off so much of 80s horror because it showed people that, yes, you can rob a major hit. And out of that, we can get a new villain that can carry the torch when they weren't making any Halloween films in the 80s. We didn't get Halloween 4 till 1984. By that point, we were on what? Final chapter? Because Jason fucking lives, son. He was alive. <laughs> he was slaying. Did they expect that Time. to happen? No. All right, Cody, Jason you can shows join in, bicker back and forth. You have one minute to duke it out. Go. Jason doesn't show up till the second film. 
Yes. So I don't really care. But about you know Jason. what shows up in the first <laughs> film? Tom Savini's special makeup effects that change hey, everything. That's, that's something that we will agree on with it. But you also have them in four. You have them in a lot of other horror films. But when you watch that original movie, it's only popular, it's only beloved because the franchise is beloved. And as much as Betsy Palmer is awesome in the role, the way that they utilize her for a whodunit completely breaks how you do a whodunit. Because we don't know who the fuck done it until she just shows up and says, hi. Here's the thing. I agree with a lot of what you said, but I think it's fucking awesome. And it doesn't Don't matter because the first time you watch that movie, do you guys remember the first time you saw Friday the 13th? Did you go into it knowing that Mrs. Voorhees was the killer? I yeah, did not. because I saw Scream first. Here's my hot take. Are you ready? Please. I do not. Aang and Katara should not be a couple. Yeah. No, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? Th that's right. I said it. I said it. Here's my arguments. Ready? Dante Bosco is Zuko, and he's really attractive, and I think Katara and Zuko would be a much more interesting, complex couple than Aang and Katara. Here's why. Zuko and Katara have a lot more in common than Aang and Katara. They have both lost their mothers to the Fire Nation. They both have to deal with trauma, which matures them a lot faster for their age. They are 16 and 14 in the cartoon. All right. Is that your final thought? That's All I right, could keep could going, but well, yeah, okay. okay, but no. Adam, well, you well, are, well, there wasn't a single thought in there, so I don't. <laughs> final, what? Where was the oh! where was the first thought? All right. I feel like this audience is on my side. Listen, this is gonna kind of go against me, but opposites attract, and I know one's water, one's fire type, but that's fine. But Aang and Katara complete each other because they're so separate, they're so different, and they grew to each other over three books, over three seasons. We grew with them. They got a very Jim Helper, Pam Beasley relationship. Will they? Won't they? We want them to. People want these two together, and yes, the show's biggest fault is that it gave audiences exactly what they wanted, and for that's some true. reason that's now bad. I, I don't know what happened where we decided that good things are bad things, and cats and, and dogs live together in harmony. It's true. One minute, argue back and forth. Okay, great. Aang is 12 in the series, and he spends most of the series trying to learn to take ownership for, for the fact he didn't want to be the Avatar to begin with. Character growth, yes. Sure, character growth. So is Zuko's. But I'm saying Aang, at the end of the series, is only 13, and he's still a child. And he acts like a child, and I think everyone in the series actually calls him a kid several times over and over again. He needs to mature a little bit more before he takes on a romantic relationship because he didn't even learn to take They don't get married at the end of the season. They have care. a kiss. They share a like kiss. A, it should have been Zuko. It should have been Zuko. <laughs> Zuko spent half of the season. No, two of the freaking seasons trying to kill them. So maybe she's still a little frosty over that. I understand, but that. Zuko understood Katara. He understood her need to confront her killer just like he confronted his father This is for fan casting. Ten seconds. This is fan casting like Rey and Kylo Ren. It's a terrible idea when you actually, actually try canon, it out. that actually was canon, though. How All dare right. you? How <laughs> dare you? <laughs> All right. Who agrees with Bevan, her hot take? They shouldn't have ended up together. Where am I? Where am I right now? <laughs> All right, where are the romantics in the room? You agree with Adam that they belong together. Thank you. Yes, yes. You can't clap yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was cheating. You have a mic. There's too many remakes. We all think there's too many remakes. But we all have that one where we're like, yeah, but I think it would be great if we remade this one. Can come you back. Wait, I need right, come back. This. Can you define, like, how far back is classic? Uh, you, can, whatever, you can do whatever you want. I'll, I'll okay. kick this one off. Back to the Future. It's a transferable concept. What? It's what? a great movie. That is what? And a, a 1985 high school going back to 1955. Is this you should be disgusted to call yourself a film fan with an what? answer like that. It's, <laughs> this, is it's new in, this is terrible. It's new. <laughs> I hate this. I hate that you put me up here. Like, this you. isn't even an answer I disagree. I, like, I fundamentally am judging you as a human being right now. <laughs> and I'm so sorry, but that is the truth. We... We got a picture with yes. them. The three. We met them yesterday. We, we, we took it yesterday, and Biff bullied us. They, we had to retake it. We walked back, and he goes, oh my God. you doofus is coming back through again. Can't even take a picture. Like, we got bullied by Biff. But also want him recast for the year 2025. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's mine. A nice, simple take there. You just gotta, what, which one do you think should be remade? All right, so we're going to be a little subjective with the word classic. This is a classic to me. Face Off, the John Woo movie from the 90s. 
Fucking classic. It's his best American movie. So you why get two it? charismatic leads that have the charisma of somebody like Nicolas Cage and John Travolta. Like, there's been a lot of speculation on like Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds. I know it's obvious. Get two people like that and do the same concept. Fucking gold. I actually want to see that, so I don't think that's a hot take. I think that's just a good, good pitch right there. Yeah, I'm, I'm convinced. I disagree uh, wholeheartedly, not just half-heartedly, because you even proved it. You got two charismatic leads with Cage and Travolta at their peak. So wh why try to reinvent the wheel? Nicholas Cage has not peaked. I'm just putting that out there. That's, the man is still in his that's fucking fair. prime. That's fair. <laughs> All right. Um, next, who? What? what? Uh, here, we're really pushing the envelope with the word classic, but we talked about this earlier. I'm going to go with it. Battlefield Earth. <laughs> Let's do it right this time. Let's do it right. There's it's no a, version of Battlefield <laughs> Earth another, that's done right. That's it's the another point. another Travolta vehicle, and I don't think he's in his peak in this one. First of all, the first Battlefield Earth is fantastic. It just happens to be fantastic in an ironic way that no one was intending. That, that's fair. That's and fair. there is no version of that film that is grounded and good. We're going to make one. Christopher <laughs> Nolan's going to direct. It's going to be three and a half hours long. And who's and starring in it besides, uh, are we bringing back John to do it again? Or? DiCaprio's coming in. Oh, DiCap <laughs> DiCaprio's the manimal. If I'm a billionaire, I'm funding that fucking movie today Hell just to yeah. see, see what they... See how I won you over? Now, yeah. now he's yeah, very yeah, much convinced me. We yeah, need the remake of Battlefield <laughs> Earth starring that cast. First comic book movie I saw in theaters, the first one I can remember was Spider-Man 2, Sam Raimi. I'm a huge... Oh, yeah, well, I got it. I'm a huge Sam Raimi nice. fan in general. Plus uh, Spider-Man, so that's the first one I remember. And my favorite comic book movie is Spider-Man Two. So that's, that's it. very cool. All right. Uh, my favorite comic book movie. I, for the longest time, I've said Captain America: Winter Soldier. That just kind of plays into all that old school action espionage stuff that I love. But over the past couple of years, I'm tempted to say the Batman. Everything that that guy did with the Batman just works for me. So that might be the new number one. Uh, and the first comic book movie that I personally can remember seeing was Birth of the Bat Nipple, uh, Batman Returns, or excuse me, Batman Forever, 1996, seven. Favorite comic book movie? I go with the original Superman the movie, Christopher Reeves. That's oh, the one yeah. I grew up with. So born in, yes, born in 1981, and in the 80s, he was our superhero. So those ones shaped me, formed me, and like the... Like to taking it seriously, the score, phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. Those are my picks. What did you think about Godzilla Minus One? Um, so my favorite comic book movie <laughs> is probably X-Men 2, X-Men United. I, I'm a big X-Men fan, so that one just hit all the right notes for me. The first movie I remember seeing in theaters, I think, is probably one of my favorite Batman movies, Batman Returns. Uh, Batman. Catwoman so right there. She gets it. She gets it. <laughs> all right, there you go. And you don't have to Oh, here, have both of them. No, the first comic book movie I vividly remember seeing in theaters to kind of age myself here was Iron Man 2 <laughs> back in, what, oh, 2010? Wow. Wow. So I was 10 years old. Um, <laughs> I was about to turn 30. Yeah, there you go. Um, and my favorite is, is probably the most recent film here as well, Avengers Infinity War. I adore that film. It's the beginning of the end for the early goings of the MCU and the most rewatchable comic book film to me. I know, like, so Cody, I know in your position... You used to watch all the Marvel stuff, and you're just like, I don't, I don't keep up. Like, what's your take on it? Yeah, so I grew up in the 90s where, I mean, it was like well, kind of how we still are with, like, video game adaptations. You see a new comic book film, you kind of get excited, but you know what it's probably going to be like. And if it's just tolerable, you're surprised. And then we get the era where suddenly there's this consistently, like, great track record with Marvel, and DC's doing interesting stuff. And even when we had the Fox X-Men universe, it was like, man, what a great time to be a comic book fan. Past two years, if I have to watch a comic book property, it's like going to the fucking dentist. It's like, I just, I just don't care. There's homework involved. You're not selling me on it. I, I, if I wait three days, nobody that I trust is saying anything that's motivating me to really set aside that time. So there's few exceptions. We got some great ones here and there. But for the most part, yeah, when we see a new comic book movie or especially a Disney Plus show, I just can't care. I can't force myself to care until... They care. Well, even kind of in what you just said, your favorite comic book movie of all time came out less than two years ago. Yes. But at the same time, the genre as a whole, it's like, 
what's going on? I just feel tired of these things. A lot of times when I see Marvel stuff over the past two years, it's like a Taco Bell advertisement. If you like Taco Bell, what do they do when they want you to do? They want to come try your new item. Hey, limited time only. Come try the new cheesy, spicy, crispy Dorito box thing. And then you get excited. You go. You slam good. your money down. You take a bite, and you're like, "You sons of bitches! This is the last. <laughs> this is the same ingredients you've been serving me since '94." And that's how the last number of them have felt. It's the same ingredients, the same formula with a new skin, but they don't feel different. They feel like I've seen this 18 times before. Ever since Iron Man 2, it's been an event to go to the MCU, you know, to the theater for a new MCU movie each year. And when they were doing two a year, it was like you get one in like May, one in maybe November. It was an awesome time. Now, we definitely live in an era of oversaturation, but it's weird. The way I look at it is like the MCU, I would put, I would put a stamp on it, hit or miss. It's like, oh, they'll put out this movie that I hated, and then they'll have Loki season two, and I'll be like, just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in. You know, it's one of those situations. And so I will always, like, like I'm so in, far in. So many people my age I talk to are so deeply committed. They're going to watch every new MCU project for the rest of their lives. It's almost, it's kind of a chore at times, honestly. But I do love some of the things we're getting, but that's where I stand with, like, the MCU. I think a lot of non-MCU projects, that's where this genre is excelling right now. I will say the oversaturation is a huge issue for me. We went to Universal last night after hours, and we were able to go on the same roller coaster over and over again. And after the third or fourth time on Hagrid's, as great as that ride is, it loses a bit of its luster. And I feel like Marvel keeps trying to repackage these things, but like Cody said, it's just a Taco Bell meal in a different wrapper with a different name. Uh, the last year, we had Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, or as I lovingly refer to it, Quantum Shidia. Uh, Thor, Love and Thunder. My mom watches these and she doesn't like that kind of language. I apologize to Sean Chandler's mom who doesn't like the salty language. I noticed you didn't scold Cody when he swore earlier, but that's fine. <laughs> that's fair. Um, and Thor, Love and Thunder was, was just absolutely embarrassing. I think this whole idea of just green screen churn and burn is getting really played out. They put these digital backgrounds. Nothing seems real. Even when you're in Asgard or a magical place, you can still get a connection with these actors as long as there's something tangible and physical there. But they're just so stock at this point. It does really feel like AI is taking over these movies and it's just not magical, much like the rides were last night. They don't really have an end game or like to, to, to what end are we going now? I feel like every phase of Marvel was kind of leading somewhere and that kind of built up some just general excitement and we got to enjoy the individual stories along the way. And I think now they're just like trying to hit beats almost. Like, oh, here's a character that you all like. Isn't that good enough now? And so I, I think rudderlessness is a big problem. It's like so many of these characters, like when are we gonna see them again? Who are the current Avengers? Like we right. introduced characters back four years ago and we don't know when we will see them again. Yeah, I, I think like the post credit scene thing was really like popularized by Marvel and now it's almost like a it's almost gimmicky because like there's all these I don't have to like remember like there was something at the end of Eternals that was like pretty significant and yeah, uh, Harry you know, Styles like Harry oh, yeah. Styles is in the <laughs> MCU <laughs> guys that's that's how they fix it yeah, yeah. <laughs> Harry Styles One Direction there's also a giant hand coming out of yeah. half of the planet that they just don't address yeah, anymore about. which seems like that would be a thing I'm a big fan of less is more uh, I know it's it's fun to get like 30 movies in the same property, but typically you just see the, the coaster go down and never back up again. Um, devaluing the property is kind of a thing Disney's been doing across the board, not only with the MCU, but Star Wars we're seeing this. And I think it's just because they're burning all these shows out. It's like every week there's a new Marvel show or Star Wars, and they're trying to tie them into each other, and it's just too hard to keep track of. And Again, if they were standalone, that's one thing, but these are all kind of married together, and it makes this ugly stew at the end where She-Hulk is part of the same universe now as I maybe Deadpool, I don't know, and the Marvels and Captain America. It's just too much. I don't care. Well, and I've had this same conversation with so many people where I used to watch everything. I just can't keep up anymore. And it's compounded by every other, like every streaming service, every IP has so much stuff coming out you can't keep up. Like, people keep saying, like, hey, Sean, are you going to watch The Boys? Hey, Sean, are you going to watch Invincible? Like, I want to. I just only have so much time. Has the bubble burst? Probably not. Does it maybe need to shrink a little bit, dial it back, and make the ones that we make, make them special and original? Yeah. 
Yeah. That's what we got to do. You can't turn it into Taco Bell. You can't make comic book movies the chilies of movies. Make them special. Make them find... <laughs> Chilies is Come, delicious. Coming up with some new phrases here. Yeah, yeah. You're there for it. The, the first hierarchy time. of food is about to change. <laughs> yeah. The Spider Verse films. Yeah. That's proof oh, yeah. that original great comic book movies exist. You're right. And beyond the Spider Verse, I think is probably like got to be up there for most anticipated upcoming. And I think that trilogy has just proven that animation is an untapped potential for the comic book movie genre. Yeah, hundred percent. Uh, first, I want to say the utter disrespect for no one saying Madam Web is disgusting. I mean, I, th I think we can all agree that the Sony non-Spider-Man Spider-Man universe is just phenomenal with Venom 1, Venom 2, Let There Be Garbage, and uh, Morbius. Morbius? Yeah, it's Morbin yeah. time. It's Morbin time, baby. Uh, no, those movies are embarrassing, but um, I think I'm kind of excited for Kick-Ass, the reboot that they're working on. Uh, I didn't apologize even know they were doing that. that. Now I'm title. excited. Yeah. Um, I don't like. I look at it and I feel if they can course correct, if they can make the right changes, there's plenty of things to be excited for because we love these characters. They've made great movies, but you can't just because one worked doesn't mean you can put out three movies, five TV shows in one year and keep up the quality and that people just go, yeah, one scoop of ice cream's good. Let's eat twenty. No, 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 no. You'll get sick of ice cream really fast. And so, um, there you have it. Thank you guys so much yeah. for joining. Any final yeah, thoughts? Thanks for joining us. Madam Web is out very soon, so get your tickets now. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, today, we're going to be talking about the state of the horror genre. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's Cody Leach. I have a horror YouTube channel. I, I do talk about all other genres, but the sandbox of horror is where I play in the most. Uh, I got some YouTube friends. I got a buddy of mine from, you might recognize from some reality TV. Uh, we're going to be talking about what made us a horror fan, why we continue to be a horror fan, what the state of horror is, what's exciting about it, as well as what's a little concerning for the future. So we'll try to have some fun. First off, we'll do some intros. Who are you? Why should we care what you have to say? Uh, my name is Sean Chandler. I have a YouTube channel called Sean Chandler Talks About, where I talk all things movies. And so, dive into... Um, Can you speak up, Sean? Oh, sorry. My <laughs> voice is completely shot. This is day four. and been talking to people, leading panels, and um, so it sounds like I've been smoking for the last 50 years. But, um, so, been watching movies my whole life. Love watching movies. I'm in a household where my wife doesn't watch any horror, so that's what, when she goes to bed... The horror begins upstairs in my office, watching all sorts of wild, crazy stuff. And this way. I'm Adam from Adam Does Movies, also a YouTube channel. I love all genres of film. Horror has a special place in my heart, though. But, oh, someone's waving. Okay, um, yeah, I'm just excited to be here and talk film with you guys for the next 45 minutes. So let's make it happen. And last but loudest. What up, Megacon? <laughs> my name is Joey Sasso. I am from Netflix's... The circle, perfect match. I'm also a filmmaker, actor, but horror has always been my favorite genre. It's something I could talk about all day long, and it's something that today we are going to ask you your questions because we have a lot of hot takes, and I know how some of them feel on some things, but I want to know what you guys are excited about coming up in 2024 for this calendar year for horror, baby. Awesome. Well, I'll start off with myself. So my origin of being a horror fan goes all the way back to 1994 where I was four years old, walked into our apartment that we lived in. My father was watching a movie called Child's Play 3. Didn't know what the hell that was. I'm used to Disney movies and goofy movie and things. And I see this molten plastic and this title screen and just the words alone captivated me. Chucky immediately just made me a horror fan. Freddy catapulted it. Uh, Slasher is probably my favorite subgenre, but ever since four years old, that's just been my bread and butter. And especially when I was a kid, I think what drew me to it so much and why I held it so close to the chest all the way into my 30s was for the longest time, I don't know how, if most horror fans, even like heavy metal fans feel this way, it's kind of like this tight knit little group. And for the longest time, there was nobody, especially my age, that knew what the hell Chucky was, knew what horror was. And especially when I got on YouTube and found that there were so many of you that was like me, it was just like, open it up to this whole new world and never even realized was there. Yeah, so I grew up with a mother that didn't watch horror movies at all, but she would go to head, get bed early, and TBS, TNT, they're always playing the Friday the 13th movies. In particular, New Blood. And maybe not my favorite anymore, but I just remember all these scenes of this girl's like pulling down 
power lines, this guy popping up out of the water, grabbing Jason, pulling him under the water, and then the part where Jason does the circle saw on the guy, just those iconic images, that was the origin of me watching horror movies right there. I was like, I gotta see what the rest of that is. And I remember, not full-blown horror, but watching Predator one night and being like, that was like the most tense thing I've ever seen. Like the one time a movie like made me tense. And it's like, uh, I don't know, I'm going to go to bed tonight. Like that thing might come and get me. That's kind of where it started for me. And then the way life has played out, my wife doesn't watch horror movies. So continues to be that piece where once again, go to the internet to find other people. And on that journey, found Cody. Mr. Adam. We're an action household. My dad was big on Van Damme, Stallone, yes, Schwarzenegger. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah, yes. he's very excited about that. So, um... <laughs> There was a lot of crossover with some of the horror elements. You have Predator, which I grew up with, the Alien franchise. Um, and from there, I just fell in love. And I remember watching Gremlins at Christmas back in the day when parents didn't really watch their kids. They just let them do whatever. So I I'm seeing Gremlins get put in microwaves and stuff. And I, I think to myself, this is where I want to be in life. And, and so I've fallen in love ever since. Awesome. Mr. Sasso. For me, it was Wes Craven, man. Nightmare on Elm Street. Then you start going down the list. I mean, do we all have those memories of being a kid watching something we should not be seeing at that age? When Many. you're watching Scream, when it's coming out and everyone's talking about you have to see this movie. And then in retrospect, you're like, oh, I got to live through essentially the 80s, meaning Halloween changed everything. We rolled into the 80s. We had all the ripoffs. 90s, we had Scream. Then we had all the ripoffs, Urban Legend, Valentine, all of which are still fantastic because I love ripoff horror. I think it's so much fun when you have a hit and then you see what it does for the genre for the next 10 years. But for me, it became a thing of seeking out filmmakers and seeing every single thing that they had done in their career, which at that time, Blockbuster, for those of us who remember, only carried certain titles. So it became a thing of how am I going to find Last House on the Left? I keep hearing about this, but there is nowhere to find it. There was something about being a horror fan in that time where everything was not accessible that made it even more fun. And yes, if you met people like ourselves and they were on the same wavelength, it made things that much more fun. I think that there are many things to be excited about. I think there's going to be a lot of filmmakers who are transitioning to horror because the Jordan Peels of the world have shown you can make a real film and audiences will show up for it. I think the most exciting thing for me is that uh, despite the fact that I'm with you on a lot of like loving franchises keeping going, I mean, one of my favorites is Chucky. It's still going. It's still the same yeah. continuity, same creative team, for better or worse. And you, <laughs> maybe some worse. But you have what's exciting is there's so much unpredictability with what is coming. Like, I know January 1st, when we kick off a new year, my favorite horror films of the year, I don't even know about them yet. Mm -hmm. X, Barbarian from 2022. Had no idea what the hell those were until I walked into the theater and sat down. Ended up being in my top five. Barbarian and was trash, though. Oh, so wow. <laughs> Wait, what? Does anybody want to replace Sorry. this scene? What? Hated that movie. What? Okay, why? I just need to know why. Um, It made no sense. Mm -hmm. it, it, like, there's a lady living underground, somehow sustaining life, and then she falls off a water tower, spins in the air, holds on to the spoilers, woman. Spoilers. Spoilers. <laughs> it's just a comical movie that, if you even think about it for half a second, doesn't add up. So but, I was with it. I was with it for the first half hour, but then it just goes into Looney Tunes world, and I'm gone. But That's to me, why the it's thing, awesome. Yeah, I and know. The, some people like that. But I, I love I, that the whole point of the movie is bar the barbarian is Justin Long. That's really what it's down to is he's the monster. I have a thousand things to push back on, but we yes. don't have time for it. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'll send you my, my review afterwards. I'm down, can, for yeah, down for it. Down for it. How many of you love when you walk in and just go blind? Yes. Yeah. I'm telling you, like, Sinister was the movie. This is years ago. Sinister was the movie that broke that for me. It's like, here's the whole movie in two minutes, and oh. every surprise ruined. Ever since then, I've made it a practice. Unless it's something like Halloween, and, like, I feel, like, contractually obligated to watch the fucking trailer. Yeah. <laughs> but anything that seems interesting, if they just tell me the premise, and I know I'm going to buy it, walk in blind. I cannot... One of my most vivid movie memories is hearing about this little movie called Hostel in the, in the halls of my high school. And I'm like, what is that? Okay, new horror film. Drag my dad to go see it. First 20 minutes, he's like, what is this porno that you brought me to? <laughs> and then an Achilles heel gets cut, and we're like, oh, what the fuck? What happened? And so those how old, are the how best. How old were you? Uh, 16. Okay. I saw when I was 13. Yeah. That was what nice. a baby. Yeah. <laughs> I, had, I had a dad who was also very supportive of my love of the genre. Yes. yes. Absolutely. So... I know you're a little bit more pessimistic about 
what's going on currently and a lot of the, the franchise churning out. But what's what's the thing that excites you the most right now about what's happening in horror? Like, what do you want to see more of? I mean, to your point, I do appreciate that Barbarian was different. Yeah. And, I, again, I really like Jordan Peele and how he does do the elevated horror, but it still is scary. It reminded me of Jaws when I saw Nope the first time, which... Mm. I consider Jaws a great horror film as well. Yes. Um, so even though there is like the big movie franchises, mm. we still do get a Thanksgiving from Eli Roth that I thought was fantastic. And Loved it. We'll probably turn into the next. You know, it should have been called franchise. "I Know What You Did Last Thanksgiving." Yeah. It was such a love to '90s <laughs> horror, and that's what made me happy about exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. And we were talking a little bit beforehand. It's kind of interesting, especially from our perspective, where like last year almost seems like the kickoff of like Rise of the Horror YouTuber Creator. Yeah. I was yeah. Say, the Talk to Me guy is making an awesome movie. Talk yeah. to me it was fantastic that it should have fantastic. been called talk to the hand though i still can't yeah. get over other than talk to hand. <laughs> adam you kind of alluded to it a bit whenever we were talking about our, our optimism but like is yeah. there something specific a trend or or even just a trope of horror that just you don't want anymore trope not so much i think that those exist for a reason because people do enjoy them at the end of the day you like to be scared and even if it means it's an obnoxious loud noise that's doing it or it's the mm. cat it's always a cat jumping out of something um, I do really get annoyed by the misdirects in a lot of A24 movies especially. They seem to be the biggest kind of uh, a bad guy when it comes to... They pick up a lot of properties that have nothing to do with horror, but then they kind of advertise them like they're horror. Lamb, for instance. <laughs> I was like, what am I watching here? There's nothing scary going on. Uh, then you have um, Men, which I saw last year, and I, I, I was just so miserable watching a movie about a guy like giving birth to multiple versions of himself. Yeah. Like, this is not horror, <laughs> but it kind of is, I guess, to be fair. Impossible movie to discuss, too, because no right. matter what you say, you're wrong. Right. But my, my classic example for that version of A24 is a movie called It Comes at Night. Yeah. yeah. My oh, wife was yeah. flicking through Netflix, and she's like, what's this? It seems interesting. And I was like, ugh. And she goes, so what comes at night? Nothing. nothing. Absolutely fucking nothing comes at night. Exploiting copyright to put a superficial... IP skin on your crappy slasher. Public domain. Oh, Public no. domain universe. So <laughs> Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey, where you've got a bad slasher and you put an even worse Winnie the Pooh skin on it and there's nothing to do with the lore. Not really. There's nothing. It doesn't capture the witty banter, the energy, the characters. It's just, that's supposedly Winnie the Pooh, but he kills people. Adam, is there a property that you're just done with? Just seeing a trailer announcement just going to hurt your soul? You know, I, I'm i a little bit more of a bitch, I think, than everybody else here. When, <laughs> when, a, when a movie franchise starts to lose me, I just walk away. So yeah. there's a lot of horror movies where I'm like, I don't need to see Jason in space. I don't need to see, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, John Wicking on a bus. There's just a lot of things that I just, I walk. There's so many good movies out there that I don't need to, like, have this blind allegiance to a lot of properties so no i don't think there's one there's like a hundred that i just don't need to see any more of i think you just need to let halloween sit like just let it sit for a while i'm not saying never return but let's take a break how just, dare you sean i think the how like dare. halloween died the, the simplicity of it it's not really designed to have over 10 movies in the franchise yeah it's a very simple concept and that's why we kind of keep going have like four different timelines rob zombie reboot it's so and, much fun and, though I, I, I feel like the, the, where they missed it was if they could have this time done the halloween 3 thing right yep. and used halloween 22 to launch off kind of this um spin-off anthology version you do halloween ends not as kind of uh, uh, Christine, kind of the end of a sock trilogy, but you do it as like its own spin off in yeah. the universe that's inspired by that doesn't have Michael Myers. I think people respond a lot better to it because it's not trying to be two things at once. The final showdown for the 11th time between uh, uh, Lori and Michael and setting up this other guy, but they didn't do that. And so I think they had the potential to create the one that has longevity, but as is the simple like, how many times can he return? Yeah. Isn't the fun of you guys running YouTube, like, I don't know, if we're all going to, if we're all going to see a movie, he hated Barbarian. I loved it. What? 
I and love now, having those like, conversations. Fuck you as a person. Right. You're a let's terrible. Have, let's have a conversation. Yeah. That's well, that's fun. the fun of cinema, right? Like well, that's to why me, Siskel and Ebert were like the greatest movie critics. Dude, you could listen to the them worst debate thing that can happen, in my opinion, is someone who makes films trying to make movies. Is you watch my movie and you go, "It's fine. It was a movie. It was a movie." Like most yeah. of 2023. Yeah. So piggyback on on that. So we were at Fantastic Fest back in September, and it, it's absolutely true. You, you you like to think that we're just talking to fans and the, 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 the studio execs and they don't see our stuff. We're sitting down and like a little backstory, Halloween 2018, I gave it three and a half out of five. How I got, I got dragged you? across You're going to for hell. months, for months. It was the, the, the grossest era of my channel. We're sitting down on the curb. This guy walks up, he goes, Hey, I'm a, an intern over at Blumhouse and we think you have the most interesting takes. And I was like, <laughs> can you say that into the camera, please? Yeah. Like, it was so funny. But anyway, Get piggyback on what he was saying. Some of my favorite conversations to have with people is when I could not disagree more with them. Yeah. It's, it's interesting to me. There's nothing really interesting about, I totally agree. Right. Okay, well, that's it. Like, we, we're doing a live stream either end of October, beginning of November. We were talking about Saw X, which I already knew we both loved, mm -hmm. and Exorcist Believer, which he had yet to watch. And I hated it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, 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 I don't necessarily want you to love it because I'm going to be really concerned about what your movie taste is, but I kind of hope you love it because it's going to be an interesting conversation. And he's like, I kind of hope I do too. On that note, guys, that's going to be it for us. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you for another awesome year at MegaCon. This is our last panel. Yeah, please make some noise for horror. Yeah! Woo! We're going to grab a selfie after this if everyone wants to gather in the middle. We're going to be down here in just a second. Sean will be over here for some meet and greets for a while. All the rest of us peasants without a table will be over here. <laughs> Thanks, guys. So come hang out with us for a while, please. Thank you. Selfie real quick. Well, there you have it. Some of my favorite moments from the panel. They, they mostly included me because, of course, this is my channel. And I just, I just am so full of myself at the end of the day. <laughs> If you made it out there, give me a shout out in the comments or just comment below what your favorite moment was just watching these videos. Also, as a bonus, I have a vlog thing I'm doing every single week. That doesn't mean they're all gonna go out weekly, but patreon.com slash Adam Does Movies members get access to those vlogs every single time they go out. If you are a $10 member, you get a vlog a month. If you're a $20 member, you get two a month. You can kind of see how this is going up until up into four. A month and again they're not gonna be weekly some they might come out like all at once you just don't know but I am I am dedicated to four of them and I have a big one for MegaCon that I'm putting together so look for that in the coming days all right thanks again for watching if you're new here please subscribe if you stumbled upon this and thought who is this clown I like him I want to hear more from him and do me a favor and go subscribe to Sean Chandler, go subscribe to Cody Leach and some of the other people you've seen on this panel. They're all good guys. I, I know this from firsthand experience now. I can, I can just say confidently that I spent a few days with them and they're wonderful individuals. And that doesn't mean that they don't have skeletons in their closet and they're probably serial killers. But I got anecdotal evidence because I was with them for three days and that's all you need. <laughs> all right, hopefully I see you next time. Thanks for watching, take care.